Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on Phyllis Wheatley and her poetry. So Phyllis Wheatley lived from 1754 to 18 to 1784. Uh, she lived a very brief life, 30 years, and yet within that that span of years, uh, she was able to do a lot considering where she started life, uh, which is she was a slave from Africa and she was brought to the United or she was brought to the colonies in uh, at the age of seven. She, the family that bought her actually did educate her and clearly educated her substantially enough that we're still reading her poetry uh, almost 250 years later. She is the first female uh, female poet of African descent. Uh, there's some claims, there's some debates about whether she's considered the first just uh, just poet of African descent or the first female poet. There's another poet at the time of African descent, Jupiter Haman, who there's some debates about who actually published first or who's considered uh, the poet, you know, who's considered the first poet or not. But she was, uh, I think it's important to note that she clearly wasn't the only uh, author of African descent writing at this time. And her work is still read widely today. So her big publication, or most well-known publication, is poems on various subjects, religious and uh, and moral. And this is published in 1773. So if we do the math on that, she published a work uh, by the time she was 19. I think that's important to note that she was not only brought over under the under the auspices of slavery, but despite that, being only in the country for 12 years, was able to publish this book or collections of po collection of poetry. And largely her poetry was well received not only in the colonies, but in England as well. Uh, and there are, on both sides of the Atlantic, various, um, various, ma various memoria to capture her. As her poetry goes, it's nothing it, it, its nothing outlandish. It really does embrace the various cultural themes of the late 18th century, which is fascinating in some ways. In other ways, I think it opens up an interesting conversation for us to have about as a former slave <coughs> in the colonies, which are, this is still pre, much of this is still pre- uh, revolution much even after the revolution there there's still much of this that is clear that slavery is is a part of the american society and so there is a question of exactly what could she actually say about her experience being completely embedded in the culture and i think that's an important thing to note is just what is she what is she able to say that people will listen to that there will be a publishing there will be a possibility of publishing and there will be a pop possibility of an audience to actually read her words and so <clears throat> i think you know what she does write is is quite good but i also wonder how much could she actually write if she lives in a culture in which the opportunities for her to have her own unique voice are limited. So we're just going to take very briefly a look at uh, her poem on being brought from Africa to America and just kind of see some of the, the dynamics that go on within this. So, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there is a God, that there's a Savior too, once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, their color is a diabolical dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train." So we can see here she's both, you know, on one hand, paying, uh, pay, paying thank you to the ways in which she's been redeemed, but at the same time, she's playing a game very similar to Anne Bradstreet in which she's also tweaking her audience. She's pushing her audience. She's saying, mm, "This is something you need to remember," right? And and we see that in the last few lines, right? Some view our sable race with a scornful eye, right? People are very very skeptical. They they say, you know, that that they're questioning about the veracity, about the the ability of people of African descent, and 
her response to that is, remember Christians, Negroes, black as Cain. And to understand that line, you have to understand that for a long time, within Western Christian tradition, it was believed that the uh, the African race was the race of Cain. That 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 being having that skin tone was the mark of Cain. And to understand what the mark of Cain is, that refers to the biblical Cain slaying his brother Abel, and then God marking Cain to let everybody know what he had done. So she's saying, remember, these people who you tend to associate with Cain can be refined, right? Can be saved and join the angelic train to be part of and to enter into the enter into heaven. So I think, you know, she she's playing around here saying, she's thankful, right? Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught me my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and that there's a Savior too. And I, once, you know, once I redemption neither sought nor knew, I never even knew about it, never mind sought it. Um, but it has been Christianity that has brought me there. And please don't, you know, she's essentially saying, don't throw out all people of African descent that there is there is saving to be done. I think on the one hand she's she's throwing into the face of of Western culture of the col of the col uh, of the colonists. You know, do not disregard this these people that you have chosen to enslave. But she can't say that outright. Again, being an African, being of African descent, being born a slave, it is extremely hard, particularly in the in the 1700s, to speak out that uh, clearly to say it that straightforwardly. All right. Hopefully, that gives you some ideas of what to think about, what to look at when you're reading the rest of Phyllis Wheatley's poetry. And I will see you in the next lecture.